All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so we wanted to, um, our next topic or area of discussion that we wanted to get into was broker interaction. So, um, you know, obviously the, the brokers um, are, um, and I, I would add into that software developers uh, as, as appropriate, were, were key components um, to, to getting the alpha pilot up and running. Um, so we've got some, some questions here, some topics to just sort of kick around. And I mean, um, just sort of open it up for our understanding a little bit from the importers. Um, how, did, how did you get the information um, to, to the brokers? And I, I guess we're talking about here the reference, um, uh, the reference number primarily. How was that transmitted and how, I guess, did you align it with um, incoming entries? Give us a little bit of, of background on that. This is Bob from f and uh, We tied it to our style master files. So when we created the import, we actually kick off a comma delimited file that was EDI'd over to the broker with the registration number on it. We, we did um, uh, two different um, ways of transmitting the information. We're not EDI connected to our border broker. Uh, so what we did is we gave them the LPCO code with a product database and they programmed that into their article product library and used that every time we made a shipment. So that was the manual process. 99% uh, of our business though is EDI with the broker and we do tie it to our product master file. So within our product master, all the information, we use a series of flags to flag the article as subject to the CPSC pilot. And from there that kicks off a series of business logic to go out and pick up the GCOC full PGA me message set. And then that gets incorporated into our XML to the broker who then puts it into the Kater. From a Walmart perspective, um, we have EDI transmission set up with our brokers for um, purchase order data. We don't have specific product data that they call through and pull. We push them um, specific purchase order data depending on the clearance port. So we couldn't necessarily tie the registry number to an EDI feed. Um, what we had to do is we had to take what Kara had entered, um, run reports to identify which purchase orders those products were attached to, and send the broker via an Excel spreadsheet a complete listing of purchase orders that that registry number would apply to for those two for the two ports that we were working with. So it was manual. Sounds like a very manual process. Very manual. Yeah. For Fruit of the Loom, it was also a manual process. Um, we provided spreadsheets for both our full message set data as well as our reference certificate numbers to the broker uh, matched up with the correct product ID and they added it to their internal product library. So, so I'm hearing that if, if it's not an EDI, it was a two-file transfer where the broker then had to join based off the filing. Okay. For Procter & Gamble, we also followed the manual process. Uh, we, we separated our, our normal process of information uh, for this pilot specifically uh, because we were very limited we were limited our participation to a particular supplier uh, and port, and um, but uh, we simply added the reference number to uh, our product data master file for that supplier, um, and with the anticipation that eventually it will become an, an electronic process once all of the data elements are finalized. Uh, this is Garrett with 7th Avenue. Um, ours is pretty simple. Uh, we basically just tacked the reference number uh, onto the end of our EDI feed to the broker, um, and that related to our um, complete parts database that we transferred to them. Okay, from the from the broker's perspective, um, what were some of the the issues or challenges that 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 were faced? Um, 
Um, you know, I, I know we had um, we had heard about about some issues, and we knew there were some delays um, from um, getting the 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 uh, the code from the the vendor software vendors and getting that code um, tested and, and implemented so you know some of the challenges that that sort of the brokers faced and perhaps even some of the um, the challenges as it related to their interaction with software vendors we'd love to we'd love to get some more uh, information on that hi this is Ian Smith from expediters and um, <clears throat> we actually did not have a, a lot of trouble. Um, for one thing, we are a, a self-programmer, so we program all our ABI software. Um, and we opted for the just the simple transmission of the registry number. Uh, so that was quite simple, uh, quite easy to get up and running pretty quickly. Um, we, you know, we could have done the full data message set, but it, it just made much more sense to go with the simple transmission of the registry number, which was pretty easy to get. It was very simple to get from our importers. And um, from a technical standpoint, I don't know if um, anyone from our Seattle, from corporates on the phone, uh, I think everything went just fine. Um, to add to what you said, Ian, from our perspective, because Expeditors was our broker of choice for the pilot, what um, what I the feedback I got from them was that you know as long as they had the data, they could supply the data, and that was fine. However, there was a disconnect between what um, we had has been indicated on the survey in terms of the to message set total versus what they filed. So. Um, they stated they filed 140 entries on our behalf. We have 121 message sets. Um, their thought process was that there was a potential for disconnect between CBP and CPSC via the ACE transition. So something maybe you want to check. Yeah. Line, their entries were 105. Lines were 140 for us. And they say there was 120. 121 was listed Sorry. and 136 on the okay. survey. So just well, something to see what, yeah. where the, the drop-off was. Yeah. yeah, just something there might to be. check. Um, yeah. If we could, I mean, if they have that good of data, if we could get it from them with the entry okay. numbers and entry lines. Well, we can work with you to try to figure out where that drop is. That would be great. We can absolutely look into that. Yeah. But other than that, you know, they didn't have any problem, as Ian had indicated. Mm -hmm. And expediters, again, uh, you only uh, program to be able to transmit just the reference number, correct? Yes, Jim, that's correct. Okay. Um, so I think, uh, Geotis, um, if you're on the line, you, um, you also uh, program to be able to file the full PGA message set. Can you give us a little background on, on, on that process? Sure. We actually use an outside uh, software provider. We don't do our own programming, so our software provider did do that programming for both the full message set and the registry. We actually do have two separate applications for ABI. This is Chris. I can speak on one. Maybe I'll have to speak on, speak on the other. Um, so for the one, everything went uh, fairly smoothly. I think our biggest challenge was in adding the CPSC information to our internal product file. Um, we had to kind of quickly come up with a way of, of doing that, which long term probably won't work. So we'll, we'll need a better method of doing that with the larger pilot or the, uh, the actual go live. Um, but overall, I think everything went fairly smoothly. I think the registry was definitely the easier way to go, and we would want to encourage our importers to use that as the preferred method, if possible. So 
the easiest, the easier that is for importers to use, I think that's going to be the better. Um, if Jennifer, you're on the line, maybe you can speak about our other system and how it went. Sure. Um, well, I, I can't really add much except the fact that I know that one of the challenges that our software provider was facing at that time was some of the other changes they had to make with uh, the ACE implementation. So certain things just had were put in a different priority. Um, but once we did get the programming in place and we tested it, we were able to, to send them through successfully. ACE, ACE implementation was, was interesting. Um, you know, and we, I think we have that as sort of a bullet point on, on the next side with filing. But, um, you know, I, the, the, as, as you all know, the, um, the ACE schedule um, slid and uh, we were hoping to hit sort of a sweet spot in there in between um, uh, ACE implementation and other things, but it ended up that we got um, really stuck right in the middle of, 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 of prime, I guess, programming time for ACE. So we do recognize that um, there, were, there were higher priorities with mandatory ACE um, uh, transition that um, we we came we bumped up against and uh, and I think we we lost uh, out on the, on the priority uh, a number of times so uh, but yeah we do recognize that Bob did you have yeah Jodis filed for us so uh, at F and T uh, and of the 27 you know products we did 359 uh, line line entries 342 uh, CPSC uh, message sets I think. Everything went okay. I, d I do know they had challenges, you know, setting up uh, some of the programming, you know, with uh, ACE challenges like you just mentioned, and along with, uh, I think, some of the challenges with the transmissions. But uh, once they got past that, it, it worked fine. Yeah, I would echo. Um, Jodis was the one that filed R, except for the Laredo. Border Brokers is what filed for us in, in Laredo. Um, the programming ACE definitely um, contributed to some of the delays in that they had to dedicate their resources for some of the ACE implementation that was mandated. <laughs> so it did push it a little bit. Um, I think one of the other things that we struggled a little bit with in Geodis is that initially they had programmed to file at the, 30, at the 7501, which is the standard trigger for CPSC filing on the summary. And uh, when they went to to program the error messages coming back or the accept messages didn't make a lot of sense according to the 7501 or the summary filing. Um, so we switched to the 3461. I think that piece also caused a couple of delays into when we should have been filing um, because of the 10-day delay or the 9-day delay between the 3461 and the 7501. So that was the other issue that we saw. So you were getting errors when you tried to attach it to the 7501, but not the 3461. Correct. Okay. And then when we got the acceptance messages um, against the 7501, uh, they didn't make sense because mm. they're really designed, I think, to attach to the release, to the, to um, the which is a, an indication of hold authority rather than right. um, just contributing information. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, I think you're all familiar with, um, so CPSC had, um, you know, we had put together with uh, working with, um, with CBP in, in, in review of the trade support network, our, our, our CATER, our implementation guide. Um, you know, I guess just sort of a general question about, um, you know, uh, how, any comments on that guide, and, and I guess in particular, um, looking for sort of any feedback on anything for the future that we could do better as far as interacting uh, with the trade, I would include brokers and uh, importers, um, you know, if, if we're able to move to, to a beta phase, what could we do better as it relates to communication, um, documentation, anything that would help the process smoother? For example, um, with um, uh, companies that would that might join that are brand new to this I have a thing that could relate to both this issue and uh, previous issues that we haven't discussed 
Uh, it's, sorry, I said so Magnus Bjerg from IKEA. Uh, uh, I don't know if any one of the others have been thinking about the disclaimers, meaning that we will have a flag on a certain custom codes, ACA codes, that says that we need filing. But the product requirement definitions and uh, the custom codes don't quite really match up perfectly. So we will, there will be a need for disclaimers. And for us internally, that seems to be a more difficult situation to handle because it's a, it's a non-requirement. Uh, we are, we are clear, we know exactly which product we should have a certificate of compliance on. The question is how do we identify correctly which product that shouldn't have a certificate of compliance and should have a disclaimer instead. I don't know if there's any other company that have been thinking about this. This is Jennifer from Walmart. We have been thinking about it, not necessarily from a CPSC perspective, but you know, Fish and Wildlife is another good example of that, um, where the disclaim process is potentially burdensome because you essentially have to, it's not a yes, no anymore, it's a no, but right. here's why. Yep. Yeah. And um, sometimes that's more information gathering than you have already with a yes answer. Yeah. Um, and you have to maintain records associated with that, where in the past you didn't. So, um, so yeah, we have thought about it. It's it's not something we've necessarily addressed yet, but you know, it is a, a good issue to. Talk, yeah, and talk that's to. it's a, it it is an issue for us that we that we definitely need to think more about as well. Um, just the, sort of the nature of the HTS. Um, you know, there are some codes, toys, for example, are a lot more straightforward and I would expect less disclaims, but uh, when you get into some of the apparel, um, <clears throat> disclaims can be, <clears throat> excuse me, a, um, a really big issue and, and how do you address that so that, you know, again, trying to get back to um, minimizing the burden um, and not having to spend a ton of time disclaiming, so. I think to add to that, um, two things. One is that um, it may be subject to CPSC, but no testing required. Is, is that disclaim or is that a, a GCOC? And then the second would be there are some items that ha have a tendency to be in a gray area that you wouldn't necessarily flag the HTS for, but they're probably still subject to CPSC. And how are those, you know, accommodated? No, the 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 general process um, envisioned across the jurisdiction for CPSC, um, just just from a very high level, uh, if there's no certificate expected, um, you won't have to. The HTS will, will not even be on a list. We won't even be looking. Uh, if there's, you know, below a certain percent threshold on a, a, a proportion on a certain HTS. Uh, there's going to be a lot of burden because it's going to be a majority disclaim. You know, how much, how much are we going to, I mean, this was an initial thought as, as we're digging through this. Um, above a certain threshold percentage, let's say 70% or 80% of the HDS is expected to, to, to apply, you know, in that situation, then, you know, um, those uh, exemptions are expected to, to be on there and it's, it's worth the burden potentially in that type of an instance. Uh, the, the fine line is going to be those HTS codes where it's, you know, um, the, the Toy 90 code, the, the above 12, uh, you know, how many of those are going to really be ones that we're watching? Um, you know, imitation jewelry, those are another, you know, those are questions that you just have to say, do these really, uh, uh, what's the proportion? What's the burden versus the, and that's something that, that it's a hard one for us. Yeah, it's definitely I, a hard one for us. I mean, I, and we identified that early on. Okay. If if it's a burden or it, it's hard for you to also, it's hard for us as well. So yeah. we're trying to second guess what we think you might be needing or wanting. Um, so maybe some clarity around that right. would yeah, be great. Yeah, I think that is definitely an area we need to work on. Well, I think as Jim said a little bit earlier, the Alpha Pilot was really broad 
intentionally because we were trying to get, you know, volunteers with whatever products they wanted. Um, one of the things we, we are looking at and thinking through with regard to the, the beta is what makes sense. And we're not necessarily thinking that it's going to be this kind of free-for-all, but more how do we prioritize what we're looking for, not only to help CPSC, but to help the people who sign up and who want to come on board to say, you know, let's make this make sense and be logical and be what's really important um, and also just to give you more guidance. One other thing to consider too um, is that, you know, the beta pilot or I'm sorry, the alpha pilot was pretty straightforward in the tariff classifications that were being used. You know, essentially, it's it's called for in the tariff. It's a GRI one in most cases, so easy to recognize, easy to flag, easy to say yes to. But further to her, to her point, if you have embedded items in a kit that are subject to a CPSC requirement, but the nature of the kit itself isn't a toy, um, then you have to be. We have to be able to account for that testing on that particular item, but how do we declare it at entry? Because the primary tariff code, the way we do it is X, V, V. The X line is going to be declared. The V lines are going to be supportive and there, but not necessarily seen by your side. So those are the kinds of things that, you're, that need to be considered as well. As, as you move down the level of as the level of classification gets more complicated from GR1. Right. right. And, and, and in and terms of kits, cetera. one of the, one of the, this is John from CPSC. Uh, in terms of kits, I do know there's a nuance within the UPC G10 that supports the identification in the GPC of kits and specifically bundled beyond a, a classification, which is one of the reasons why that's so attractive, is that if it's a kit within a certain classification, that's something that we're going to be potentially interested in if it's a kit that's outside. And so it's identified as a kit, and we know that there's going to be elements, and we, we, that's something HTS can't do. Uh, in some instances, uh, the products are supposed to be declared separately, and in other instances, they're not. And, you know, that nuance is a tariff issue um, uh, in terms of how they break that out, but it's not a character product characterization issue. And so it's hard for us to, to, to get that standard policy. Um, I understand that. But for us, <clears throat> it's going to have to be an exception management that, that we have to account for. So that will be difficult to automate. Agreed. Se. So we are very sensitive to the exception issue. And we've, from the very beginning, as we've been looking at the overall products of risk, how does that get managed? That's something that's that's been on. Right. And I think a lot of it goes back to sort of looking looking forward is um, how we define scope, and and what are those uh, tariff numbers, product types that we are um, really interested in? What's the data that we that we need to be able to do import targeting? You get, I mean, it can you you can get into the weeds very quickly and uh, get it can get very complicated when you start getting into kits and jurisdictional issues. Um, um, you know, we, we, we do our work based on a feed of data that we get from CBP and that's defined by tariff number. So um, it's how does all of that mix together. Uh, it, it definitely is a very complicated issue. If all the HTS codes were as clear as toys under three, <laughs> Life would be wonderful, but I, we, we're going to have to nuance this together. So, all right, I've been told it's a good time to move on. <laughs> so, um, and again, I, I know, and we've we've talked about, um, you know, I know there's there's just sort of overlap with all of this. So, you know, feel free if you if you have comments on some previous issues that we've talked about, feel free to come back to them. I mean, we, we are, um, we want to make this sort of as informal and, and conversational as, as possible. Uh, but sort of the next topic that we had um, um, is around filing. Um, and, um, you know, I, I sort of hit on this a little bit about, you know, sort of uh, what could we do better? Um, but, um, you know, sort of t t thinking about filing um, 
what what could be any suggestions on on how we could um, do this in a way that it that that puts the least burden on industry? Again, you know, sort of this is a trade-off here in the sense that we're we're trying to get data that is going to help us do our job better, and as part of that, better means that. Um, we don't stop shipments unnecessarily. You know, we, we can identify those risky shipments based on the data that we have. So part of this is we do feel a trade facilitation uh, aspect in that if we get the additional data, we know what not to look at. But um, with that in mind, sort of thoughts on, you know, how could we? How could this be set up in a way that um, sort of sets out the least amount of burden on on industry? Any any thoughts? We'd be welcome to hear. Yeah, this is Ken from Walmart. I think we just have to be very selective about the data that's required. I mean, in, at the end of the day, whether it's automated or manual or some combination thereof. The more fields that are required, the more um, tar tariff codes that are required, on and on, it, it's more work, you know, regardless of what that system looks like. Um, and so I think we really need to understand, find that sweet spot between, and I know, I know you, you're working to do this, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but we really have to find that sweet spot between what is the burden, because the burden can be significant, um, versus what is utility of, of the data. And so... You know, I, I think that we need to continue to have that conversation is what, what is it that the CPSC is really looking to get out of this? And what is that smallest universe of data that, that, that trade can provide to you to accomplish that goal? And, and let's, let's see if we can find a way to settle there. You know, I'm worried that, um, you know, I'm, I'm worried that, it, you know, it, you know we'll, we'll take one step forward and then we'll take another step forward and then a little bit more data and then a little bit more data. And then all of a sudden we're overwhelmed and we're, we're providing just, you know, millions of lines of data to the CPSC and, and really you're utilizing, you know, maybe a fraction of a percent of that um, and, and, and not, 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 not even be designed that way. We just kind of find ourselves there before we know it. And so I think we just need to be really disciplined about what do you need, how can we provide that to you, you know, in the least burdensome way. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I, I, the chairman, in, in his open remarks, I think he used the phrase that the alpha pilot was was testing the plumbing, and that really w is what it was. I mean, we set up we set up the structure, right? We set up the process, and and the volunteers um, and the brokers really helped us in in testing that to see if it worked. The beta has always been envisioned by staff is testing the elements. How, do, how does the data itself <laughs> help us to do our job better? And I think that's where we get into um, the conversation about are those the right five pieces of information? In the end, is it, is it less that we need? Is it more? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'd have to think that it's going to be hard for us to say that we need more when we're not testing other data elements. But... Um, you know, the commission, I think, was, was really, really listened to the feedback from trade um, as we were, we were discussing e-filing at the beginning to try to come up with what were those data elements that, that we think would enhance the risk. And that's where the beta is, is, is really um, uh, hoping to go, is to test that data to find out whether it is, in fact, the right data elements. And I'll just give you my, my, my first concern around the beta, and this is one of the reasons in our, in our responses back to you, we didn't, we didn't fully commit to participating. Because my concern is that in order for you to obtain the amount of data you need to really test what's useful and what's not, it's going to require either an enormous manual lift on our part or it is going to require some sort of systems development. And, and until we know what that system is going to look like long term, that's not an investment that I can go to my bosses and say we need to make. Because as soon as we make that and we finish the beta pilot, we're going to say, oh, well, actually the system would work better. Now that we've had, you know, 200 participants or whatever it is, the system should actually look like this. And then we're going to throw money out the window. So I, I'm not sure how we're going to balance the need for you all to acquire a lot more data from all your participants versus the need for us to have some sort of 
finality around what the automated process looks like bef before we start developing towards that. So I, I'd almost say I think we need to maybe focus on that systems piece, that automated piece, figure out what that looks like before we move to the massive amounts of data to, to determine what is really beneficial. Currently, the CPSC is directly sharing information with CBP to be able to assist our processes out of the ports. Um, jurisdictionally, um, we're talking about some, some 90 um, odd million records a year that are being passed so that we can understand what's going on. Um, the volume of information there is, is it's, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. And the process that we've got established with CBP was one that was, was mandated under the Safe uh, Ports Act that we needed to, to and, and uh, participation in ITDS that we get this done. Um, the standard setup there is, is, is you know, uh, is something that could easily apply the other. We don't want to have multiple different tools as well. I mean, we, only, we have limited staff as well as you know. And so we can definitely take the lessons learned from that and apply it back out. Um, the technology piece is something that we can definitely work with you, work with you all. And I do believe in terms of developing some type of technological standard is something that's not going to be a hard, a hard lift in terms of proposing out. Um, so, I mean, that's something that, that we can work through. We can definitely work through. And we're doing it right now. And the agency has standard exchange going. So um, it's, you know, in terms of cost, uh, We'll work through that. I mean, you, you know where I'm headed. So, I was just going to say, I, I think you know the 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 line or um, sort of the objective in and I because I agree with you on the technology part of it is is getting getting that to be as as easy as possible to to um, to transmit the information. I guess it's also having it be flexible that if in the end say um, CPSC determines that um, we don't need five elements, we need three, that, you, that, that, the, assist, that the technology can change and, and not, not in, without incurring a tremendous amount of cost so that it can be flexible enough to change that. In, in that type of an instance, you'd have the same hardware and you'd probably have the same general programming. It's just that what you're going to be doing is your XML uh, layout would, would change. The difficulty would be we as an agency don't want to have um, individualized feeds from each company. That would just be ridiculous. We don't have enough staff to be able to do that kind of thing. So, I mean, just envision it's going to be a standard technology, like an SFTP type drop and, and, and process, uh, EDI exchange, where, you know, on a periodic basis, we would say, okay, this data is not working for us. We're going to drop these, or let's maybe add this one element. There's no way that, in, in my mind, beyond five, six, seven data elements are ever going to be useful to the agency uh, just because of the nature of what we're trying to do. It's product risk. It's entity risk. It's location risk. You know, it's not... There aren't that many elements that we need to be able to, to churn this. So uh, that's my view at this point. I, I think I just want to say, you know, all good points, but to what you have said specifically, Ken, we do hear you when we sit around talking about what this beta looks like. Our question is, what, what do, how do we design this so people will actually participate and that it both makes sense in the short term and is leading to something that CPSC can get behind long term and be able to tell trade and the importers and the industry this is something we're getting behind long term. And whether that's minimizing HTS codes based on what we feel we really will need, will look at, will use to, to help indicate what we want to look at and what we don't. Um, we're looking at a lot of different ways to try and make sure that what we're asking for is what we're actually going to use and that we're not, to your point, just collecting data to collect data. And that is a huge part of what we're working through 
with this report that we're putting up and with how we're putting in options for what the beta looks like. Yeah, under a beta, I mean, the, the hope is that, um, and we, we have to work this through, but the information would then be directly tied into the system that we're using out at the borders and be able to flag folks to differentiate the product and be able to demonstrate that and, and to show how, you know, um, the scoring and the, the overall methodology would be significantly impacted within that, that structure on a larger set of data that's coming through. Um, the the one-off collection that we did, you know, we, we didn't integrate. Um, so that's something that we can, you know, uh, we're going to be working towards. So. Um, I, I know we have a message here about about warning messages or a, a question here about warning messages. Um, and, and I think there was a little discussion, but uh, sort of any other uh, feedback information about about any warning messages that you received um, and um, I guess were they instructive as to what the issue was um, any thoughts on how they could how they might be able uh, to be made better uh, moving forward so they so that they are better instructive uh, of the issues I think most of the issues we had during testing were resolved. There were a few of them that were unclear that we had to go back and say, I'm not sure what this means. Mm -hmm. I think there were a few of them that it Geodis encountered that we had to work with CPSC to, to clear up. It was on the CPSC side. Um, and if we're timing that with the one USG release through ACE, um, I, I think that's even better. So that it, it conceptually, importers know that CPSC is part of the one USG. Just, um, I guess before we, we move on, um, just uh, any, any other last thoughts, comments on, on filing? Um, um. Uh, well, let me speak again from IKEA. Uh, one thought is when we go further, we're going to be to be the beta pilot, and as early as possible, we would need to know if we're going to have the same elements or if we're going to have other to be able to prepare in a good way. And that, that applies also to when that it's time for the real thing. It's very good if we know in far in advance exactly what type of data and structure it should have because once it's real, uh, we cannot say to CPC or to anyone else, oh, sorry, we, we, cannot, we don't want to participate anymore. So we would need to have everything in order and everything as it should be. Understood, and yeah. That takes some time. It takes time. And I think to, to add on to what Magnus says, um, I, I absolutely agree. It's, um, it's quite easy to add information to an XML to transmit data. Um, but thinking through that process, while it's quite easy to add something to an XML, it requires mapping on somebody else's side to receive it in, to put it someplace, and to map it back out through ACE. The other thing is when we add a data element, we all have to go back into our source systems and say, hmm, where do I get that from? How do I interface it in a, a good way to our entry data so that it flows through without a lot of manual intervention? And I think that's where Magnus is coming from, is that when you think about, oh, I, I just need an extra data element, think about really the timing that it might take to add that data element and what each and every one of us will have to go through to ensure that you obtain what you need. Yeah, I think. I think it Go ahead, Magnus. Yeah, yeah, just to give you one small example, we, someone changed a, a bracket in the feed and the whole flow, information flow stopped. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that could also happen if we add something new. Uh, you don't know 
exactly how everything will behave until you have really tested it through. Right. And, and that's something we want to do in very good time before we're going to go really live in something and also preferably in the same thing for the data pilot or the beta pilot. Right. And I think, you know, the staff sort of that, that has been working on this, that is, you know, certainly something that as far as scope um, that we have our eye on um, in order to be able to provide some options to the commission. And, and I think the two big areas of scope are um, scope as far as it relates to products, um, HTS codes that would be um, in, the pot, in the beta, and then a scope as it relates to, to data elements and what data um, we would be looking for. Again, I, I would just say, you know, the alpha was really set up to test uh, the pro set up and test the process. The, the, the elements um, themselves really have not been tested for their usefulness in targeting. And so, um, you, you, know, I, you know, just my, my own personal opinion is I, I'd sort of expect them to, to remain the same going into the beta because I don't think we have a basis for really recommending changes at this point. I had just one other technicality that I wanted to add on a technical, and it, it might be that we're operating a foreign trade zone. And I'm not sure if anybody has brought up the use of a foreign trade zone and when the most appropriate time. But what we have found with other government agencies moving into the PGA message set, that seems to be exceptionally problematic. Um, so it, you know, if there's an opportunity to think about that and we, how you use it, that would be fantastic. We've met with foreign trade zones uh, several NF, times, NF, and to yeah. understand that the general process and when it would be ideal. Uh, for example, you've got a standard weekly release uh, that you're going to be pulling out, and when when to declare and when to get that information through has been something that we've been actively uh, studying as part of this overall process as well. So. We're, we're cognizant and we'll, we're willing to, we would actually love to have uh, the pilot participants under the beta who, who are going to give us curveballs, such as the FTZ issue, such as uh, I'm only ever bringing paper to, you know, the CVP desk. I'm, you know, these are the kind of things that, that under a beta you want to understand the full breadth of, of the process to make sure that you're addressing it as best as you can before you turn it on for full production. I mean, we really want to make sure that we're getting a, a, a full understanding for all the different processes and the nuances so that we can share policy uh, prior and discuss uh, policy prior to, to flipping that switch. Yep. We did meet with the NAFTZ folks, and, and they, were, they were great. They came in and, and really, um, really laid the foundation for educating us. <laughs> it's a, FTZs are a, a complicated... Um, it's, it's a complicated process, so, but, they, but they were very helpful, and um, we did commit to c continuing to have dialogue with them to understand it. They were, um, w we talked a little bit about e-filing. Um, they were, um, you know, particularly interested in certificates of compliance, which is, you know, this is all sort of um, uh, mixed up together. But um, so that, um, but yes, yeah, so we have had dialogue with them and continue, we probably will continue to have that. All right, so we're going to uh, move into our to our last topic, and um, it's really recommendations. And you know, we've touched on a, a number of of these things already, but um, you know, this is an opportunity to um, to just um, you know give us your thoughts on 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 what can be improved um, as we move to a, into a beta. We're always we're looking for that feedback. We we do really feel that. Um, we've had um, that from our perspective that this has been a great um, a great situation in that um, you know we've we've really worked closely with with some really good importers and brokers to be able to develop and test this process and we want to keep that dialogue open um, we want to um, continue to try to learn from you as far as your experts and what you do um, so we want to try to learn from you as far as um, 
you know, what is the best way, again, striking that balance, what's the best way to try to create the least burden um, on industry while still allowing us to get data that we hope is going to make um, our job um, and what we do better. Uh, so, um, you know, with that, I, I would sort of open it up. There's some, you know, some specific questions here. Um, you know, improvements uh, moving into a beta, onboarding and communication, um, the testing phase, the production phase, uh, post-implementation, pilot timeline. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll just open it up and, and anything uh, that you all have, we, we would really welcome to hear. Um, so first, I think IKEA would like to say thank you very much to the CPSC for doing the pilot. Um, compared to other PGAs that have gone live into the PGA message set, this has been very organized. It's very been very pragmatic, very open to questions, responses available to the community. So thank you very much. We were very pleased with the um, the onboarding, the communication the phase of the pilot, it went quickly. We didn't anticipate that it would go as quickly as it did. We were hoping we'd be ready at the beginning instead of a little closer to the end. Um, so that kind of brought us to the other areas that for IKEA, we felt that maybe the production phase would be a little bit longer so that we could really get a handle on what we were seeing, what we weren't seeing, where would we need to make modifications or changes to enhance the process or gain efficiencies while at the same time getting you what you needed um, as an agency. So that was IKEA's feedback. I do think on timing, you know, we were really hopeful. Um, we went live in July. And we were really hopeful that everyone would sort of be ready in July and get sort of a full six months of filing. Obviously, that, that didn't work with, with everyone. Um, so in, in, in the way that we had... Um, set this up with CVP as we had sort of defined timelines and we had put a Federal Register notice out with some specific timelines. So it really did kind of um, box us in, so to speak, on, on scheduling. I would say, you know, sort of the staff's view on the beta is that the, um, uh, that, that would be a pilot that would be much longer from a data collection phase, uh, probably about a year's worth of, of data or a timing um, to file because we would be looking uh, to be able to get that data to uh, determine its usefulness and, and sort of have a much larger number of, of, of importers participate. So um, we are thinking about a longer um, uh, implementation time there. Yes, definitely uh, a broader number of participants. Uh, you all were the cream of the crop and my expectation is that you know, if we did integrate this with targeting, we would have not done anything. So um, the the issue is that for us, we would want to, you know, integrate it potentially with recalls that, that are announced, be able to integrate it with other processes that we have within the agency, spend that time. It's going to take time to, to key all that up and, and to process it through and then to deal with all the different ways people file, all the different modes of entry where we're going to have issues and where this this actually provides a different benefit potentially at the sea environment than maybe a land border. Um, give those kind of nuances. And potentially the land border, it might even be better uh, depending on, on how uh, active our feed is, you know, uh, over time. So, you know, these are the kind of questions and, and that a beta would, would allow us to be able to demonstrate a lot more benefit over time. Um, and to really be able to provide a much better set of procedures to support everybody, not just the cream of the crop. So. Um, I have a question or a thought, actually. Um, in <clears throat> terms of data validation on your side, you know, we, we are, I think you heard, we're entering, we're reviewing our product, we're dedicated to doing that, we're entering our product detail data requirements into the registry. Um, is there a way to establish a timing aspect in terms of, you know, a pass-fail kind of thing? So if 
you, we as Walmart have entered in 3,300 products into the product registry within a certain amount of time or even a rolling amount of time as products are being entered and reviewed. Is there a way for your validation process to identify a, yeah, we're going to target this or a, no, we're not going to target this and notify us ahead of time or notify the trade ahead of time so that we can take care of it prior to entry? whatever issue may be. That's a tough one in that obviously the classification would need to line up to be able to give us an indication that the, that the cargo is out there. In terms of if there were specific warning flags on a manufacturer that you may have provided that information on or if there is a known recall on a product that you're, that you're uh, providing us information on the registry way in advance, and you weren't aware of this for our code, um, there might be something that we could work on to do that. But we've not, we've got to be in this process through with you as part of that, that beta. But it does not serve us at all um, in wanting you to uh, send through the process something that we know that's going to be recalled, that's going to be stopped. We want to give you as much advance notice as possible for us because it then provides us the ability to not have to look at that product at import. I want my people looking at other stuff. If you're already giving me a warning ahead of time and in my systems, I can, I can do that ahead of time. It would make sense. Um, how that works out, we'll have to, we'd have to beam that through. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because the way that we do risk analysis, we do it at the, at the line level, basically. So um, that's, that's where our, our, our rule sets and our scoring kick in. So what, if I understood your, your question, I think what you're looking at is for us to push that risk assessment prior to entry at the product level. And, um, We'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to think about that. That's just not how we're set up now because the way that our, our targeting system is set up is we, we get this feed of data from CBP on, uh, based on our jurisdiction. Then based on entry or, or based on line, we do our risk assessment. Now this, uh, the, the uh, e-filing data would be additional data that would feed our rule sets is, is the way that we've always uh, thought about it. Right, and if it's coming in way in advance and we've got something to tie it to, we'd have to set up programming to match that up, do the join, and provide some type of notification, do some research, and then reach out. That's a new process for us. Right. Yeah, that would be a new process. But it's, it's definitely in the realm of what's doable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely something to consider because if you've heard, as you heard from everybody, they're tying the registry to their product. You know, we're an anomaly in that way. We then have to tie the registry, the product, to a purchase order, to an entry. So if we can tie the registry to a product, have that product reviewed, then, you know, obviously we can still assign a registry number to that product for entry, but if it's not tagged at entry, then there's not as much pressure from a timing perspective to have everything on our side done and completed and reviewed and renewed and reviewed you know, prior to entry. So um, I just think it's something to try and consider. Mm -hmm. It may also um, eliminate the need to, to justify a disclaim. Because if we've had that product reviewed, we know it's not subject to, even though the tariffs say it may be subject to, then there's no need for us to do a disclaim process against it. I, I would argue that as our process would mature, if you ever filed a, a disclaim against a product code, you would not necessarily need to do it more than once because we would develop a history file that would state that this was a disclaim. And potentially at that point, we would then know and not send you an error message saying that that was ever a problem with that code in the past. I'm just I'm thinking this through with you out loud as part of this. I'm not promising anything, but yeah. this is the kind of these are the kind of processes that as we develop this over time, that that you can have those built. Right, but you're you're thinking that from the code level, not the product level. I'm thinking that at the product level. Okay. 
if you disclaim at the product level prior, uh, prior, and it's been shipped in, and there's a verification, maybe some type of checkbox that might have been done that, yeah, okay, right. we didn't need a certificate on that. If I have that sitting somewhere, I can match that on any registry coming through, and then if you file it, it makes sense. Right. It's not built, but it definitely right. makes sense. <laughs> the theory I, makes sense. I, I think the theory does make sense because just thinking about the information that we're going, that you get right now, say, that we've gotten in the registry, it is a lot of those core pieces of information that you would use for targeting. You don't have the, you don't have the entry information, you don't have um, the, the line information, but you've got a lot of the key components. It's just like John said, you know, we're just, we're just not built like that. Not to say that that's not a good place to go at some point. Right. Because when you get right down to it, it's about the product. It's not about the tariff. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think this as we a... consider those topics and we consider that type of process, though, I think we have to consider the interface with ACE and the interface through U.S. Customs and the brokerage who may have programming tied to saying uh, this HTS number is subject to CPSC, they may outright reject it from an ABI standpoint. You can't get well, it through. So I, I, I think right. we. Need I want to. I want to clarify that, yeah. one thing in in the vision that we've seen longer term, and this this is from a staff opinion at this point in time. Um, I don't think we'd ever have within a certain HTS code CBP reject on our behalf in advance. Uh, we would be sending signals from our system to their system interacting. There's not going to be much in the way of those bucket one failures unless it's just typed badly that they're going to say you need to fix things. But on our behalf, it's going to come all the way back to our system. Now, if there's a registry filing, there's no reason why we couldn't have our system talk to your system, potentially independent of CBC, CBP. That's added expense. That's added work we'd have to figure that out. Or potentially, uh, ACE was originally designed to try to pass everybody's trade documentations out and back through. Uh, how well would they be able to support that? We're still working with CBP to test those as well. So in terms of that, that coordination of documents, filing documents directly through ACE. So yeah, that's going to take some time. We're working on that element as well. This is Charles from Free the Loom. Got a question. Uh, you know, a lot of our products may be subject to the rules, but exempt from testing. So, I mean, you would expect all those products to, in the future in the beta programs to still be uploaded into the registry or send the uh, full, me full message set? Well, the way we had it set up, and I'll ask Lisa if, if I don't get this right to jump in, but um, I think the way that we had this had it set up is we had the ability um, where it was, where the um, testing, where you could identify the, the testing entity to be able to indicate no testing was required. But under the alpha, yes, we were asking for that information to be filed. Could we look at that as, you know, something to consider how to deal with that in the future, certainly, but that's the way that it was set up in the alpha. Under the PG message set, when we evaluated the full PG message set, there's the line exemption and then there's the test exemption. The PG message set architecture on CBP's perspective does have that capability. It also has the capability to nest multiple manufacturers within their architecture. That being said, I don't think in this, in this pilot we want that route. And in the beta, we'd want to test more complicated designs. Um, so uh, you do have the ability to do test level exemptions. You do have the ability to do entry line. This HTS is exempt. So um, yeah, that's, that's how we do it, how we test it. We want to be able to get a little more complicated under the beta. But just to clarify, we, if in that situation, Charles, we weren't expecting you to put it in the registry and we weren't expecting you to file a full PGA message set. There was an alternative message set, which we believe will move forward with um, where it's basically you, de you declare the exemption and say, 
I didn't need to test this. So it's not a full PGA message set. It's small, kind of like the reference PGA message set where it's very minimal information and you just say, hey, I know this product falls under an HTS code that you might be looking for, sort of, you know, the GOC or, or, or COC or basically the testing information, but I have an exemption, here's why. So it, it's a small, minimal amount of data to try to lessen the burden, but from our perspective to know that you understood that you needed to file something and that you didn't just not file testing information, we need something to tell us that, hey, yeah, I know about this, this is why I'm exempt. Thank you. This is Ken from Walmart. I guess a couple thoughts I have talking about maybe recommendations for the beta. Um, you know, and I think it could be challenging when you have 100 or 200 participants, but I think maybe um, some, some more routine conversations like this throughout the course of the beta I think would be helpful. Um, you know, even if it's once every quarter or, or, or a six-month toll gate, something like that. Um, you know, certainly we've submitted some written information, but I, I can't imagine you get as much from that as you have from the conversation here. I know I certainly uh, wouldn't have. Um, so I would encourage us to maybe try to find opportunities like that just to touch base, how things go and what do we need to test that we haven't tested, that sort of thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the other thing I would recommend if you haven't thought about it already is seeing if there's some way we can test the Trusted Trader program as part of that beta too. Um, just anticipating that that will be a component of whatever full implementation is. Um, I think it would be a good opportunity to, to see what that might look like. Um, and certainly to the extent that we're a beta pilot participant, we would, we would be happy to be a trusted trader in that and test, <laughs> test it out for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, all right. Um, you know, I would sort of open it up um, for, for anyone that has any uh, last comments, suggestions, recommendations, anything they would sort of like to, to say as part of, part of this meeting. Um, um, and um, you know, then we'll we'll kind of go from there and close up. All right. Well. Okay. So, again, just thank. I want to thank everyone for for all of their participation in the pilot, um, for making yourself available and participating today. This is. I agree with Ken. You know. Um, you can get written feedback, and that's that's helpful. But to actually be able to have a conversation and ask questions and um, and have a dialogue, there's it's you know there's no uh, you know there's no substitute for that. So I agree with you as we move forward. Um, I I hope that everyone has recognized that we've been willing and available to talk, and um, you know having these uh, public meetings is also very helpful. And we, if we're able to move to the beta. I, I certainly expect that we will continue to, to do that. Um, so um, I, again, just thank you for, for all of your work over the last several months to prepare and to program and to participate in the file data. Uh, this has been very helpful for us. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, we're going to prepare a, a report uh, for the commission, um, you know, with the, the evaluation of the alpha and some uh, options and a recommendation for, for moving to a beta. And then we'll wait commission guidance um, as far as uh, the path forward. So, um, but um, thank you again. And I, I think with that, we will conclude um, our meeting. And thank you to everyone on the phone and everyone that, um, that viewed the webcast today. Have a good day.